Good afternoon, it's Deborah Quazzo, the uh, managing partner of GSB Ventures and the um, co-founder of the ASU GSB Summit. I'm coming to you from my COVID castle here in Chicago, Illinois, uh, where, where I am hopefully at the end of my captivity, um, but, we, but we shall see. And it is um, my incredible pleasure to do what we hope is the first of many um, series of founder stories with some of the absolutely fantastic entrepreneurs in the ed tech sector. In this case, we had the, the, the incredible privilege of investing in these EdTech founders in the EdTech sector. Uh, I have with me Emmy and Guido. Um, they are two of the three co-founders of Nearpod. Uh, they founded Nearpod in 2012. And then in, on February 19th, 2021, and it was zero, it was from zero, they founded it in 2012. And in, in, on February 19th, 2021, uh, their baby Nearpod was acquired by Renaissance Learning for $650 million, uh, one of the great success stories of the K-12 ed tech sector. Um, and we had the great privilege of being small investors in the company, uh, an incredible success for us too, which we, we were so thrilled by. And, and most importantly, it was just, um, just a distinct pleasure to be arm in arm with, with three human beings um, of the characters that Emmy Guido and Felipe have. So, I just want you guys to start actually from if you if you'd reel it back uh, a decade and just just give me your founder story. I mean, you guys, you, you were the three musketeers. You joined up and you you stayed in it um, for mo for most of that decade. So I'd love to hear just the founder story. Amy, please go ahead. Yeah. So before starting Nearpod, we were running a software as a service company, and a lot of our clients were publishers. With the launch of the iPad, we were also asked to do educational apps, which we did. And then we went to the classroom to see how those apps were being used. That was the very beginning of the iPad and internet was not available in the schools, but we immediately saw that the students will grab an iPad, go through the content without interacting with another human being. And we thought, hey, a few years from now, Devices are going to cost much less. Wi-Fi is going to be available. What's in for the teacher? Teachers are not going away. Schools are not going away. We need to create a technology that will help teachers engage the students, assuming that students will carry devices. And then we started creating this technology that will give teacher the leadership and the engagement and the power to control the devices and interact with the students, one-to-one, -one, one too many students to students. And that was, we spent probably six months to a year creating the technology. And then we started to do pilots in schools. Um, it took a while to get one pilot because the, the parents and the teachers one wouldn't know what we were doing. So after a few pilots, we realized that we were into something really, really big. The reaction from the teachers and the students and the principals were, was not normal. They would just open their eyes, call other people, give us hugs. The students were ultra engaged. And a lot of teachers would say, this is the best I think ever. This is going to change the classroom forever. And we started to learn a lot of dynamics that were happening to the classroom that the students without devices would only participate when they raise their hand or they're being called out once at a time. With the Nearpod, we realized that the teachers were getting a ton of data from the students that they were not getting before. And the students were more inclined to participate because they were not exposed to the rest of the classroom. When they participate through Nearpod, only the teacher gets to know the answer. And if they don't participate, the teachers also know that they're not participating. So it's a full dynamic that it increases the engagement many, many times. And we started putting more money into it. We tried to fundraise uh, for some time, but unfortunately at the beginning, we were not successful because we were a startup. We were trying to go into education with a very bold idea. And obviously it was not very credible at that time. So we decided to keep investing our own money. And then we also decided to do a freemium model because we, under the assumption that, hey, this is amazing, but we don't have the money 
to invest in a very powerful solution, let's put out there what we have and see what kind of traction we get. And the traction was beyond our dreams. In a few months, we had many thousands of teachers using the platform. The reviews were amazing. We were selected by Apple as one of the best apps for education. The same with Google. And that traction attracted some early investors. Emmy just summarized probably in four minutes, like five years of work, right? Before <laughs> we launched in 2012, but we started playing with this idea, you know, in 2010, right? So, so that we were, you know, two years into the, the, the idea. Um, so, yeah, absolutely five years of grueling work. The, the other comment I want to make is, you know, what, what looked like incredible traction back then, right now it would be nothing. I mean, there's hundreds or thousands of startups probably, like the context is very different. Um, the, the third thing that I think uh, was probably missing in this story is like, this was not started by a typical team. We were like friends from life. We were immigrant entrepreneurs. I wasn't even in the US. When we started, I was living in Brazil. The guys were in Miami. Um, did you guys all grow up together? Is that how you, the three of you knew each other? Yeah, yeah, Felipe, Emmy is a little bit younger than we are, but like we all grew up in the same neighborhood. Felipe and I went to school together multiple times in Argentina, in the US. We went to Berkeley together after a couple of years of, of, of living and working in Argentina. Uh, so we, yeah, this is a story that comes from, uh, and Emmy and I were neighbors like two blocks away. We didn't know each other until a couple of years later when, when we when we joined forces in another venture, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a you know one of the things that we did against like there were many many contrarian trends in Nearpod when we started, right? Education and investing in education wasn't what it is today. It was very contrarian. Most VCs, you were pretty contrarian as well, right? You were investing in hundreds or dozens of startups back mm -hmm. then when everybody else had burned their 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 hands already and they didn't want to be so active in the space, but most people were not really bullish about, about this space. Um, they were even less bullish if it was any business that was going to ultimately sell to schools and districts. Now nah, we've seen it before, not super happy and we just didn't know any better. Uh, we actually didn't know, like none of us even went to a school in the US growing <laughs> up, right? So we didn't know what a district was when we started this. So very, a lot like the typical phrase of, you know, they didn't really know what they were getting into and that was probably why they got into. So, you know, staying fresh, staying innocent. I think that there was a lot of that uh, in, in, our, in our beginning. And, and, I, and I think part of the founder story was, was very, very being convinced about, you know, hey, we think we have something here and let's stick to it. Uh, so the multiple years, it took us, you know, probably cool. three or four years since idea to a million dollars in ARR, which today yeah. is probably a couple of months for a lot of people. So for some people. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we've all kind of laughed about um, for those of us who've been um, toiling in the uh, education technology waters, me, me much longer than you two, um, like 25 years, you guys over a decade. And um, the world certainly has turned in the tragedy of COVID. We've seen the complete transformation of digital education and the, the embrace of it. Um, and I just want to dig a little bit deeper because I'm sure there's some funny stories. When you all chose to tackle this problem, um, it was a big, hairy problem. I mean, you went after one of the notoriously most difficult markets, most difficult, um, you know, intransigent purchasing um, systems in the world. And, um, and it was, you were right. I mean, ed, people didn't, you know, investors were, had a, you know, had a rash anytime ed tech walked in the room, but particularly K-12 ed tech. And, and frankly, consumer ed tech really hadn't really even in K-12 at least had not begun to really develop at that point a decade ago. So I'd love your reflections in two directions. One, how many VCs said no to you? I'd love to know. It had, you know. It <laughs> I mean, probably a hundred. It's, it's yeah. just unlimited. The list is long and long. Like even friends, very close friends. <laughs> <laughs> from McKinsey that right like you know I love what you're doing like I like you personally I know you have some track record but this just goes against what we do by principle <laughs> so yeah at some point we'll we'll this is not something that has a revenge flavor or anything but 
it will be interesting even for fellow um, em entrepreneurs today to like just realize we're part of the anti-portfolio of most VCs in California, probably. Yeah, what's the advice though? I mean, you guys think, mean, what's the advice? Because because we'll hit another time when, you know, when people start hearing more no's than they hear yeses, right? You know, what's, what's your advice on how you sort of keep your brain from falling apart and your team from falling apart when you're, you know, when every door you knock on is a no, including good friends. Good friends who can't part with a dollar. Yeah, I tell you a little story. There's a founding phrase that we use at Nearport at the very beginning, and probably almost every employee at Nearport will know. In Spanish, it's called acá hay algo. It means there's something big here. So every time we will go to the classroom, any of us, we will call each other and say, guys, there's something big here. Because the reaction oh, yeah, from yeah, the okay. There's even a, oh, I could, I could just go and pick up. There's a, we did a t-shirt on Acayalio yeah. because yeah. we were just so repeating that phrase. Actually, it's Felipe's uh, authorship, so. That's great. But yeah, somebody would go to a VC meeting, come all disappointed and frustrated, and then the other one would go to a demo and say, don't worry, I just went to a school. You need to see the reaction from the teacher and the principal and the students. We need to keep going because at some point, this, the users are in love with our solution and it's pretty much needed. So that was the energy that provided us with the, the, keep moving forward, keep moving forward until there was enough traction. And it's a very fine line between being super stubborn and full of yourself and convinced that you know something that they don't yes. And, yes. and just being a fool, right? So this is the, the magic of incredible magic of being an entrepreneur. Like you you need to be convinced about something that most people don't see because if they did, it would be done already, right? It's like it's like the typical $100 bill that they, they, they taught you in Economics 101. Like two economists are walking in the street. One of them says, oh, that's a $100 bill. No, no, it's not. Otherwise, the markets are perfect. Someone would have picked it up and they just walked and then someone came and picked a $100 bill. So it's, 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 just, it's just like that, right? You, on the other side, you need to be humble enough to, to just get feedback and process it and become better. And some of that feedback is from super smart people that they know something that you may don't know. So it's, it's you know, walking on that edge of being cocky and convinced and full of yourself and, and, and at the same time absorbing the feedback that they tell you, which is most of the time well-intentioned. People do want to find companies that they believe in. It's, the, the job of you guys is not to be saying no all the time because you're just nice sayers. Is you just want to find you're optimistic by nature. So, you know, it takes time. But um, I think it's part of the process, Deborah. I, you know, we were lucky enough to have Mark Benioff as an investor. And the few advices that he ever gave was just, guys, I built Salesforce without VC money. People just didn't <laughs> see it. It's just like, People didn't understand it. The people say, oh, you're going after Oracle. Good luck, right? You know, you need to get frustrated because that frustration. But to me, if, if, if a couple of no's, 10, 5, or 100 just are enough to get you depressed and just to, you know, discourage you, you're probably, you know, you're, you're probably wrong, not for wrong the wrong business. You're in the wrong exactly. business. Exactly. <laughs> you're, not, you're, not, you're not the right person for this path. There's going to be a lot more disappointment going forward, um, even if you're successful at the end. So one of the best early stage VCs in California, the best, the ones that if you start any business, you probably want to work with them, like super top brand, like they made billions, unicorns all here and there is like, we went there and she said, look, guys, I like you. You came well recommended. I actually found your product to be pretty neat. Actually, it, it's nice. Like with this tone, but it's like, I've seen it before. You're gonna die in the valley, in the death valley of companies trying to sell to districts. I've seen it before. Uh, that that was hard because uh, you know, she's, yeah, she's experienced and she's seen it before. Maybe she's right. You know, lucky us that we didn't pay too much attention. And the other one, I would let Emmy do it because um, there was this um, investor, like angel investor, that we pitched um, her and. And, you know, we had the same thick accent that we had today. And it was probably even worse back then. Or not worse, but it was even thicker. Okay. I mean, you want to you share that story? It's no, I just, uh, I just don't believe in you guys. You, you won't be able to sell to districts in the U.S. with your accent. How are you going to sell in Texas? 
<laughs> oh no. Good Lord. But yeah. She was like, I mean, she had a point, right? It's like, at some point you're going to be selling to a superintendent in Alabama. And like, what do you think that superintendent is going to think? <laughs> uh, maybe we need to hire salespeople that are from Alabama. We were thinking, but you know. <laughs> That's hysterical. Well, yeah. no, but, but I mean, in summary, I would say that those pieces of feedback help us a lot in our freemium model and our go-to-market approach. We, I don't know if we would have gone premium. Or I don't know if we wouldn't go bottoms up if it wasn't for all that feedback. So we are thankful for that. It was very helpful for us. Yeah, it, it, so I never had a moment's interaction with you all that what did, didn't reflect humor and humility. So uh, <laughs> you guys were long on listening, which was uh, a great thing. Well, obviously, at some point, the doors did open. My great friends at Reach Capital were, uh, were, were early entrants. I actually, you know, we didn't have a fund at the point. So I, I came in at some point as an angel um, and then flipped that over into um, GSB Ventures in 2016 when we, when we started that fund. Um, just curious on the positive side of experiences with, with Venture, um, just give, give us a couple of lessons off that side of the equation. Yeah, I... I did walk the investor path and the raising money path a couple of times, obviously with Nearpod multiple times. Um, I, I tend to think that we were incredibly lucky. I, I think of investors and, and in general about the investment world as a bunch of people that are, or firms that are kind of commodities. Uh, and I, I, I tend to think that we were lucky enough to, to work with some of the ones that were not commodities. I mean. There's no other investor in education that runs a massive conference that where you can connect to anyone, right? So like just going as an attendee to GSV, ASU GSV is, is, is already an incredible opportunity. Going there and being introduced by you yourself, as we call you internally, the queen, <laughs> like, oh, the queen made this intro and she actually came like you were in the middle of running a 5,000 people. I don't even know your numbers anymore. 5,000 people event. And you just said, I need to go look for Guido, whatever he is. And I'm just going to pick him and walk him through the event with a thousand interruptions until I introduce him to ABC. And you did it countless of times over the years. So um, that, that, that hasn't doesn't have a prize, and you know I could say obviously we're we're in your in your conference right now, so in your call. But you know I could say the same about Reach Capital. I could say the same about Emerson Collective. I could say the same about most of the people that were involved. Education has this magnet of positivity. People are in it obviously because they want to create value and and return to their investors, but they're in it because they they like what, what the outcomes of what's going to happen, uh, what's going to come out of these and. And that goes a long way. So I think we were incredibly lucky to have that. And that compensate, overly compensates all the no's <laughs> that we got and all the people that actually didn't choose to partner with us. So we were incredibly lucky to have these, these people. And you know, we mean it when we say we wouldn't have made it um, without the support that we had. I just love to hear from each of you kind of, what are you most proud of in this journey? I mean, the combination of everything we've done, it's not, I mean, we created a great solution for education. Having done something, this is the first time I'm doing something in this space and having gone to hundreds of classrooms, talked to a lot of principals and seeing that we are adding value and helping teachers is incredibly rewarding. If you pair that with the fact that we create financial success to a lot of employees and to our shareholders, and, and it's a good story that immigrants came here and created a solution that helped K-12 US. So all together, it's like, it couldn't be better. It, it, it's, 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 it's perfect because I've done business before in other industries and they were successful, but doing it in education, it, it multiplies the, the reward many times. And so that's what I think. Wonderful. Yeah, I fully agree. Doing it with friends, I would say it's the cherry on top and staying friends. You know, I don't need to look very far away to know that lots of business partnerships among founders don't end up well, even for very successful companies. And, you know, if you add the friendship component, many, many times things go off. Uh, in this case, we, we, we were friends. We, we stayed friends. Friendship was a big part of the culture. 
um, and and we're best friends until today. We just, you know, I, I was telling you before we started this call, I just came back from spending a month in the U.S. celebrating with my friends. We 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 treated ourselves to lots of uncommon and unfrequent perks that you know you don't <laughs> sell companies for hundreds of millions of dollars very often. And we did it with 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 people that that we appreciate and that we love, and we will continue doing stuff together for for many many decades ahead of us. So yeah, and as as Emmy said, the amount of goodness that came out of this business for our users, for our employees, for our investors. I mean, it's just it just feels awesome. Obviously for us as well, but that that's that's. At some point, it was the the smallest satisfaction came from our own personal um, return, and you know we had employees crying with us many oh, times sure. when we saw the return. We had a fund that that you know, and it would have been you had you had a fund back then <laughs> that it paid off. Our first investor paid off the full fund. It was fund one, and you are in this business. You know how important it is to have a successful fund one to keep on investing. When one company pays off, pays back the full fund, everything else is the cherry on top. So, you know, Dude. countless stories like these, we just couldn't be prouder. And we were also were talking about the beginning, like it was a, it was an emotional process to sell. And, you know, obviously we knew that you build a company at some point when you raise money, you sell. Um, but yeah, we invested over 10 years. We were not like, you know, college grads, re recent college grads when we started. So it was a great ride, but I honestly, even not being involved anymore, not as a shareholder, not as an advisor, not as a board member, even not being involved anymore with Nearpod, I am convinced as every other founder says when they, when they raise money that the best days are ahead, Nearpod's best days are ahead of us. And, and I sold we sold knowing that Nearpod's best days are ahead of us. So I think it will bring goodness even to the buyers, which is kind of what, what best outcome in business to do business with people that you are convinced that they're going to do fine with the product that they, they buy from you is, is we're, we're proud and excited about, about you know, everything well, that happened. You, you three deserve to be wildly proud. This is my virtual bottle of champagne for you. Um, uh, you know, you have become dear friends of all of us at GSV, and we are counting on you to be our dear friends into the future. Um, you know, whenever, whenever I get an inbound call I, uh, from you, Guido, I, you, you know, I'm right back on you. Um, so we hope uh, it sounds like Emmy will stay in the U.S. You, you, yes. you translated back to Brazil, but, um, but we want to, we're really looking forward to keeping you in the GSV family. And um, yeah, we couldn't be more proud to have been involved with you. So. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Likewise, likewise. Yeah, as likewise. we said many times offline, like without the video, you know, we couldn't be more thankful. You you trusted in us early on. You you liked the vision. You even had competing assets. You could have invested in assets that were closer to your home that <laughs> but you liked us and you you just liked the the pitch and you like what you saw and you just were were a big fan ever since. And that's the kind of people that you want to work like. Life for entrepreneurs and for company builders is hard enough. So yep. you need you need people on your side that will make it easier, not harder. And you were clearly one of those. And when I say you, obviously I embody in that you and 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 the wider GSV team, which by now we we know a lot of people um, over the years, and we were as thankful to them as we are to you. So thank you. Yeah, and as I told you before, for us at the beginning, going to the ASU GSV conference was the highlight of the year. <laughs> we couldn't believe the amount of networking opportunities that we would have there and all the doors that were open. So, yeah, we're going to be forever grateful. Well, we are, you know, we love you all and it's been, it's been great being part of it. And, um, and we hope we get you back to ASU GSV. We, uh, you, you can, um, you know, even if you don't have an ed tech adventure, you can come back, we'll get you back to talk about your, um, your successes. So the food is right. great and the wine is great too. So it, it is, it is very good. And in, in music and entertainment. So yeah. All right, guys. Thank we you. We will so not much. let COVID uh, ruin our, our celebration. So at some point we will do with, with the extended <laughs> Nearport family, a celebration as it deserves. And you can count on, on you guys being invited to it. So wonderful. Ebra, always a pleasure. Yeah. All right. You. Bye guys. Thank you. Thank you.